Creality has now expanded their multicolor 3D printers to a second option. This is the Creality High. The Ender 3 naming scheme has gotten a little confusing over the previous years, and it feels like this is a total break. This way, everyone knows when looking for a new 3D printer that this is a brand new 3D printer. I've been printing with this for the past several months and have a lot to talk about. Full disclosure, this was sent to me for free, but I'm not being paid by it for this video. This is a not sponsored video, this is all my own opinions, so I can say whatever I want. First off, we should talk about the specs of this printer, and the biggest thing is that this Bedslinger 3D printer can be expanded to use 16 spools. I 3D printed these racks to hold four CFS units, all connected up to one single 3D printer. This is my 16 color Benchy. We'll talk about print results later on. The next big spec here is the build volume. The build plate is 260 by 260 millimeters and the build height is 300 millimeters. So it is a bit bigger than previous Ender 3 printers and you get a lot of volume here. Volume is the one thing on 3D printers that you're not gonna be able to upgrade down the line. There's no firmware or software updates that are going to expand your 3D print volume. Print speeds here are very fast. Most 3D printers coming out right now are very similar. They have an advertised max speed of, I think it's 500 millimeters per second speed and 12,000 millimeters per second acceleration. Advertised maximum speeds and accelerations don't really matter. The actual print profile is what really is going to be your real printing speeds. It's going to speed up and slow down when printing different parts of a 3D print. It comes with a nice fold away 3.2 inch touchscreen on here that swivels up and down and can be folded out of the way. The camera comes in a really great location and comes with a little privacy screen and a camera light. This is great for taking little time lapses, not good time lapses that you're gonna be showing off to your friends, but it is really nice for debugging. If you do have a print failure, you can look back at there and see exactly where it failed. Being a YouTuber, I would love if these printers came with really high quality cameras in there, but that always adds up a lot of processing power and cost. I do like the really clean design here. They did a lot to hide the greasy and oily bits. The linear rail that the x-axis moves on is mounted on the bottom here. That way when dust is settling down, it's not going to settle on that greasy rail. And so it stays a lot cleaner. The linear rods that the y-axis runs on are mostly covered by this plate here, so they're only exposed on the sides. This is similar to what the Bamboo A1 Mini did, um, and it's another really good way of having less exposed greasy parts. I've got two dogs and two cats, and so there's always a bunch of dust and hair around, so I do like when parts are covered like this. The z-axis lead screws are also hidden inside these vertical metal parts. The extruder cover here is easily replaceable with one screw on the left and one screw on the right. It's really easy to pop it off and replace it with a new one. The printer comes preloaded with the file to be able to fully replace it. You can replace the cover and then this indicator screw right here. This indicator dial right here attaches to the extruder motor. So that's a way of seeing if the extruder is spinning or not. It comes with a preloaded plastic one, but this is a 3D printed one that I mounted on there. Really cool options for upgradability to make it look like whatever you want. A lot of the chassis here is mostly metal. This top part is metal, these side vertical parts are metal, the entire bottom housing is metal, so it's a very sturdy, robust design. These top corner pieces are the only two plastic parts in the entire thing. Probably saved a lot of cost by making those two little parts plastic, but it's still very sturdy. One feature I really like about this printer is that all the fans turn off when the printer isn't running. So it is powered on right now. All the CFSs are lit up, but there's no fans currently running. It's totally silent when sitting on the shelf and it's not printing. That's a weird feature that you don't find on every printer. Even the K2 Plus doesn't have that feature. There's some sort of power supply or chassis fan inside there that anytime the printer is powered on, that fan is constantly running. The build plate is one of the interesting things here. It's not textured PEI like most other 3D printers. They call it a flexible epoxy build plate. So it's dual-sided, flexible metal plate but the surface coating on here, it feels similar to what came on like the Ender 3 V3 SE, which was a polycarbonate plate, but this one is a new epoxy thing. The prints stick really well to it, almost too well. If you're printing something like TPU that can stick extremely strongly to the build plate, I might put some glue stick down there to be a release aid. That way things don't pull a chunk of the build plate off. But everything does stick really well. I haven't had any print failures because of things not sticking correctly. The bed leveling also works really well with this build plate. I've gotten a lot of perfect first layers. Which reminds me, if you are looking for a podcast about 3D printing, I host one called The Perfect First Layer. It's a co-hosted podcast with Guy Dunlap and Jerry from The Print House. 
You can find it anywhere you find podcasts. The hot end and extruder setup here is packed with a bunch of sensors and awesome features. It comes with a built-in filament cutter in there, and the filament runout sensor is also built into the hot end here, so you use every little bit of a spool. That's awesome to not leave random little bits of filament in the Bowden setup, especially with your CFS units, you might have a really long Bowden setup from the farthest spool down there all the way through, all the way into the hot end. That'd be maybe a meter or so of filament that you don't get to use and you just kind of have to throw away. Instead, it's gonna use every little bit of filament. For the bed, they use a thousand watt heated AC bed. It is interesting to use an AC powered bed. The Bamboo A1 did have a recall over their AC powered bed slinger bed, but it can heat up very quickly. They claim that on 220 volt power, it can heat up to 60 degrees Celsius in 30 seconds, or 100 degrees Celsius in 90 seconds. Here in the US, I'm using only 120 volt power. So for me, it took me three minutes and 30 seconds to get up to 60 Celsius and nine minutes to get up to 100 degrees Celsius. That's from a starting room temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. So not quite as fast as people who are gonna be using 220 volt and I'm not able to fully test their numbers, but three minutes and 30 seconds is still pretty good to be able to get up to 60 Celsius on a large bed like this. It also seems like they do have proper strain relief here, but that's really gonna be something that's gonna be tested once everyone starts getting these 3D printers. Next up, I think we should talk about the slicer. Most 3D printer companies out there are all trying to make their own slicer by just putting a custom paint job on some open source slicer. Whether it's a skinned version of Cura, Prusa Slicer, or the newer ones that are using Orca Slicer, most of them just change a few colors and somehow lose features in the process. But Creality Print really is my favorite slicer because they've actually worked on adding good and useful features. The current version of 6.0, if you have multiple printers, the device tab is one of my favorite things. It gives you current status and percentages on all of your Creality printers that are connected on your local network. That makes it really easy to see which prints have stopped, which prints are close to finish, which ones are running out of filament, and little things like that. It also comes with really great print profiles for different materials, even different quality settings if you want more detail or you want to print to finish a lot faster. You can change it around really easily. The multicolor painting is really easy and additional STL manipulations, things like cutting, hollowing out, drilling in holes, or adding dovetails. I think it's awesome to have the ability to manipulate your files easily inside of the slicer. Instead of normally I would have to take that STL, put it in Blender, then do some simple Boolean cuts and slices and drilling holes and things, and then export that STL, take it back into the slicer. It's just really easy to be able to do those simple things straight inside the slicer. In most reviews, I'm usually complaining about having to download a new slicer, but Creality Print is the one that I have actually enjoyed using. You can also access the Clipper Fluid webpage directly by simply navigating to your 3D printer's IP when you're on that local network. Then you do have to add the colon 4408 on the end of that website. It is a full Clipper Fluid webpage, except you don't get access to the webcam. But that does mean you can go directly into that printer.config file and really change up some things on your 3D printer. So for power users, this is a really awesome feature. I talked a lot about the CFS units in my original K2 review, and they are the same CFS on this one and that printer. So if you have multiple of these Creality multicolored printers, you can mix and match your CFSs. They come with two universal ports on the back. You can use either one there and you just have to connect them in serial. So from the buffer here on the side, I'm connecting from buffer to the top one here, and then from the other port to the next one, and then down, over, and then back straight into the printer. It makes it really easy to customize your setup for however you have your printers and CFSs connected together. The next big benefit I really like is that changing filaments is so easy. Let me show you. You just open up the unit, pull out the filament, grab a different one, and pop it in. On an older printer like the Ender 3 V3 that doesn't have a filament cutter, you have to tell it to retract the filament. It heats up the nozzle, extrudes a little bit, retracts it out. Then you grab your new filament, put it in there, feed it all the way through, tell it to extrude, heats up again, extrudes the filament. It's just a more manual process. This is a really nice automatic process. For someone like me who's changing filaments often, it is a really big convenience to have an automated system like this versus manually changing filaments. Next up, we do need to talk about other printer options that are out there. First off, I did want to talk about the Ender 3 V3 and how similar it is to this printer. It's largely the same with a similar metal chassis. It's a Creality 3D printer. This one does come with several big upgrades there. The extruder and hot end here, I think it is a big improvement. It's got the filament cutter in there. It's got the filament runout sensor inside there. 
The larger cooling fans should improve overhang performance, and this thing does have really good overhang performance. Comes with a built-in camera in place, the RFID. It comes with a bigger build volume here. The Ender 3 V3 only has 220 by 220 by 250 millimeter in volume. So this is 40 millimeters bigger on the X and Y and 50 millimeters taller. And the biggest upgrade is the ability to use these CFS units. Even if you're not printing multicolor 3D prints, the ability to select what color you want something printed at, either from your computer or from the touch screen here, is a really nice feature. Even if you're not expanding to 16 different colors, just having a single CFS unit really upgrades the ease of use. The next obvious comparison we have to make is with the Bamboo A1. That one also comes in with a smaller build volume at 256 by 256 by 256 in all dimensions. That one does have a lot more plastic in the chassis, but does have metal arms and top rail. But a lot of the things are similar. The same swivel screen on the side, the same camera cover and light placement, the same filament ejector on the left side, the same filament cutter. But the Bamboo A1 is locked into only being able to use a single AMS light unit. This comes with a full CFS. It's not a CFS light here and you can expand up to four of them to be able to use on this printer, while both of them do come in at very similar price points. I guess it is time we can talk about the price of this print printer, and this is the one part of the video that's gonna be so out of date very quickly. Depending on when you're watching this, this part could already be out of date. Currently, the printer is listed at $369 for the printer and $519 for the combo, while the CFS alone is currently listed at $309. Now, Creality does love having sales. I will have some affiliate links and coupon codes that are linked in the description down below, and that is something I can keep up to date. But currently with those prices, the combo becomes way more of a competitive option because that means the CFS is only $150 if the printer really is $370 in both of those options. Or if you think of it as buying a full price CFS, you're getting the printer for only $210. The Bamboo A1 and A1 combo are very similarly priced. The other interesting one is the Ender 3 V3 is currently on sale down to only $300. So 70 bucks cheaper if you are looking at just the printer and have no desire to upgrade to be using a CFS in the future. I do feel like this is a really compelling option if you're already spending $300 to upgrade a little bit more. This hot end is so much better. The ability to use RFID tags still on the side here. So this is fitting in at a really competitive price range. Next up, we need to talk about the prints that I've made on this printer. And a lot of the prints have been storage boxes for my new multi-board wall. I made a massive multi-board and have been needing to print so many of these little bits and pieces for it. And all of the prints off this printer have been really reliable. Even when printing an entire build plate of something, they just all work. Everything is dimensionally accurate. They fit and screw in correctly as they're supposed to. I've also been printing a bunch of large bins and a ton of these baskets. I found this hexagon basket, which doesn't use very much filament, but it's a really large basket and I always have little projects around here. So I've kind of been printing a ton of these. It is really impressive that there's no stringing issues, even with such a large melt zone on this 3D printer. I did print out this ultimate 16 color Vinci with 16 different PLA filaments in here. And it's really awesome that they all stuck together so well. The little post on the back here was the only bit that did fall off. But other than that, all the layers are stuck together really well. Everything from silk PLA to matte PLA to sparkle PLA to multicolor changing PLA. I'm really impressed that it was able to do this. And it doesn't produce very much poop when you are printing multicolor by layer like this. Every time it changes filament, it does need to poop a little bit of filament out. That's why I rarely print those full multicolor 3D prints because you normally have to print two to three times as much waste material as actual material that goes into the 3D print. But automating your layer changes like this really doesn't need to change filament as many times. It's only once per color change and doesn't produce as much poop. So another question I've been asked is, why would you want this many CFS units if you're not gonna be printing multicolor prints? Largely, it's convenience. I have 16 different filaments all ready to go connected to the same printer. So I can have different materials, different specialty filaments. And if today I wanna to print in PLA and tomorrow I wanna to print in PETG, so from the computer, I can tell it what filament I want to print. That's one less step between me and making something. Now 16 spools all connected is a bit excessive, but a single CFS really ups the ease of use for using 3D printers. I always say there's no such thing as a perfect 3D printer. There's always gonna be some downsides. So let's talk about the cons of the Creality High. So some of my biggest complaints are with the CFS. One of the things is that you can't print TPU through the CFS. You have to use the external spool up on top here and feed it directly into the extruder by passing the buffer on the side. 
because of the really long Bowden tubes between these spools and the hot end here, it's not able to pass really flexible filaments all the way through there. That is something that's common on multicolored 3D printers and all of them that have a separate box holding your filament. The Flashforge 85X is the only one that can print flexible filament all through the same nozzle. The CFSs here don't have an active heater in there, even though they do have a hygrometer in there to measure the humidity. It gives you relative humidity and temperature inside of there, which is really awesome to see, you know, if one is too humid, but it just uses desiccant to take the humidity out of the air. There are some downsides. If it did have an active heater in there, it probably would cost more. It probably would need an external power supply and the risk of if you mess up telling it the wrong settings, if you think all four of these are PETG, but actually one of them was PLA, you could destroy that entire spool. A little bit of a petty design. I don't love the styling of the hot end here. It really reminds me of that Art Deco Mercury train. This is really a stylistic thing. I think it's because it's so plastic, because I think Art Deco is really cool, but largely made of metal. Luckily, this is really easy to replace with only two screws. And I think I like the K2 and K1 series hot ends better, just being simple, geometric, sleek designs. So I'll probably print some really cool hot end cover in the future, and that won't really be an issue. When you're setting up this printer, if you do have a CFS, you have to tape the buffer onto the side here using VHB tape. Now my issue isn't with VHB tape, that is a very permanent tape and I can't take it off once you seal it on there. The issue was that mine didn't tell me where I was supposed to place it, you kind of just have to guess. And I don't know if that's because I got a really early version of this and if they put a sticker on there now. The top spool holder has a piece of tape up here to tell you where this should be placed, but I feel like it should have a thing on the side telling you how high up you should put the buffer. I think the placement and length of this Bowden tube is really important to have correct because initially mine would get caught behind this top bar here and it would get strained when trying to start a print because it would go all the way down and to the left. So then I had to shorten the Bowden tube and it hasn't had an issue since, but it just felt very something that I had to kind of guess and figure out. Instead of it telling me exactly, put the buffer here, have a Bowden tube of this length, and that's the perfect setup. I kind of had to figure it out myself. So overall, who is this printer for? This is a really competitively priced multicolor 3D printer. No matter how much you hear it online, bed slingers are not dead. Just because Core XY is a thing doesn't mean bed slingers aren't really great and very competitive 3D printers. If you're looking for a really competitive multicolor 3D printer in this price range, the Creality High is a really great option. But that just about wraps it up. Let me know if you have any more questions or things I forgot to cover about this 3D printer. Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to help you out. As always, go out there, create something amazing today, and I'll see you in the next video.